And welcome to Advantage Radio Ministries and welcome to Second Chances. This is our weekly program in which if you know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, then you do understand a second chance. But if you don't know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, here's the great news that God loves us even if we haven't asked his to be the Lord of our life. He loves us so much that he gave us his most precious possession to take the punishment for our sins. That's Jesus. He sent his son to the cross to die for our sins so that we could have life and have it more abundantly. And that is, believe it or not, the number one reason this program is on the air each and every week right here at Lift FM. And we always have such wonderful guests. And today I know you're going to be in for a treat. We have with us uh, Dr. John Vlader and Dr. Jim Weatherby. They collectively have put together a wonderful book entitled Achieving High Performance Friendship, a book for men. So if you're a man and you're looking for friendship and a better kind of friendship, this is a program you probably want to listen to. And uh, first of all, Dr. John Vodder and Dr. Jim Weatherby, thank you both for joining us here on Second Chances. Thank, thank you for having us. You're, you're, you're both welcome. Uh, let's start off by talking with John. And John, as I often like to do with our guests, and we're going to do the same with Jim here in a moment, but John, give us a little bit of background of, of of who you are, and uh, maybe a little bit about your testimony on how you came to Christ. Thank you. I was uh, raised in Portland, Oregon, and raised in a Christian home, went to church every Sunday morning and Sunday night, as I like to say at gunpoint. It wasn't my parents' fault, but it was just, if you remember that family, you went to church, and um, graduated from high school, went to the University of Oregon, and at the end of my sophomore uh, fall term, I got a letter from the University of Oregon telling me that I was not invited back for winter quarter because I was ac academically disqualified. So I stayed in Portland and went to a junior college and lived with a couple of buddies from my high school and really began to think about my life because at that point I was calling myself an agnostic. And one night my two roommates were away working and I was in our dumpy little apartment alone and got up from the study desk and went in knelt down by my bed and said Jesus I I don't think you're there but if you're there I want to know you but I don't think you're there I kept hedging my bed and I said but if you are there I know you could reveal yourself to me in a way that I would understand but I don't think you're there and then I, I don't even think I said amen got up and went back and started studying and nothing happened there was no music no angels so I just concluded that my agnosticism was valid, but a couple days later I was walking home from, from class and I noticed that for the first time in my life I was at peace with myself. And I thought, something has happened to me. I didn't know what, I didn't know that Jesus promised peace, I didn't know the fruit of the Spirit that includes peace. So I got my grades up and went back to the University of Oregon and while I was in Portland, I, guy in my fraternity house had become a Christian, and he asked me to join him to pray one night, and so I did, and it was the first time, and this is a commentary on me, not on anyone in the little church in which I grew up, the first time I heard someone pray that I, that I thought they, they knew to whom they were praying. So I asked him if we could come back the next night, and we ended up, by the time we graduated, being there at 5, 30, 10.30 in the evening, five nights a week praying. So I got involved in Campus Crusade for Christ, and then after I graduated on time, I joined the staff of Campus Crusade for Christ. So that's really um, my faith journey in that I prayed that prayer with nothing but this bet against Christ, that if he were there, he would reveal himself to me. And uh, and, and then when I got to Oregon and, and started growing and I got back to Oregon, I uh, actually started taking every religion class I could, and a professor that I still have contact with was on his way from Christianity to the Buddhism. So he really put me through my paces, and I had a paper I had to do, and so I asked him to let me do it on the evidences for the resurrection. And he gave me reasons why Christ could not have been resurrected that I had to answer before I could do my own research. And when I finished the paper, he said, I can't argue against what you have here. So that was really the confirmation of my faith. And uh, as I said, I love him. I still uh, 
in contact with him. I'll see him on vacation in January when I'm in Hawaii. But he's now a Buddhist, but he had a huge impact on my life. One other follow-up question to something you mentioned uh, early before we uh, hear from, from Dr. Jim Weatherby. Um, you, you mentioned that uh, early on in your, your walk with, uh, before actually, actually before your walk with Christ, you mentioned that you uh, tended to be a agnostic. Uh, have you used your experience of coming from that situation to others to kind of help others that kind of thought that way to help get them set free? I have, and th- thank you for that question. Um, yes, and later on, uh, someone, uh, and I don't even remember who, was talking ab- about the fact there are two kinds of agnostics. There's an honorary agnostic and an ordinary agnostic. And the, agno- the, the ordinary agnostic says, I don't know, and you don't know if there's a God, but I want to know if he is there. The honorary agnostic says, I don't know, and you don't know, and nobody can know. And so when people tell me they're agnostics, I briefly tell them my story and then say, well, what kind of an agnostic are you? Are you ordinary or are you honorary? And they say, well, what do you mean by that? And so I explain it to them, and that opens up some great conversations because any thinking person obviously would not call himself an honorary agnostic. Mm. So I found that, that my journey and my struggle uh, has helped a lot of people. I want to say one other thing, too. I'm not critical of the little church in which I was raised, because I used to be, but then I realized, Paul says, give thanks in all things, and Paul also said, uh, the law was a tutor to me. In other words, he didn't criticize the law, he said it was a tutor, and I realized even though I was poorly taught, maybe because of my rebellious spirit then, that still helped me to get to faith, and so I'm thankful for what I had. If you're just joining us, we're visiting with Dr. John Vodder, and uh, Dr. Jim Weatherby talking about Achieving High Performance Friendship, a book for men. Uh, Jim, tell us about, about how you came to know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, and a little bit about your background as well. Sure. Uh, mine's a longer story, but I'm going to give you a Cliff Notes version of it. Uh, I, uh, I was brought up in a Christian home and found it very easy to believe. It pleased my parents, and I was just fine until uh, I went off to college and ran into people who thought very differently, and and that was confusing. The the typical derailing argument would be, what about the kid in Africa that never heard of Jesus Christ? What about him? And there were lots of things that I I couldn't resolve. Uh, My best friend died when I was 18, uh, and he he was a very committed Christian. uh, And uh, that was, uh, nonetheless, uh, hard to process at that age, because you think of death being for, for older people. And uh, so I ended up uh, somewhat derailed there for a while. I would spend time trying to read and study. I found a lot of things contradictory uh, in, in, as I processed them as a human. Uh, and I, I also was in, in academia. I worked with computers. I developed intense logical thinking, and I found, found a lot of things that weren't logical. And I would actually pray, uh, you know, God, please reveal uh, yourself so I can understand, because I wanted to believe uh, things, but my, my doubts were in the world of spiritual wel- welfare, uh, <laughs> warfare, very troubling to me. But over time, uh, and I did find the difference between uh, heartfelt seeking and seeking as in, I'm going to just live my life the way I want, and if you want to reveal yourself, you know, let me know, as opposed to heartfelt seeking, because the promise of seeking you'll find is throughout the Bible. But a lot of things just kind of kind of came to place, and a lot of it was in the context of my uh, computer-type thinking. For example, uh, uh, one of the early books that I wrote was uh, on this, as I started to get some clarity, was God Online. And, you know, Christ was, uh, Jesus was particularly good at using metaphors. And he, he would talk about the Holy Spirit being like the wind. You can't see it, but you can feel it. And John certainly felt something that night when he was walking uh, on his college campus. And that, that's a great metaphor. In, in the uh, 21st century, I can use the Internet as a metaphor because I can receive information online uh, without any wireless connection. I can get it in my uh, iPhone. I can get it in my PC. And uh, I, I know that I'm getting it because I know the information isn't there. And so I can now think in terms of praying to God as just being a wireless connection and uh, getting downloads 
uh, as being getting guidance from God. And also the other thing that, that uh, troubled me for a long time, Greg, was Jesus' teaching seemed a little contradictory to me because he would give this, even if you think it, it's a sin. And then I just felt it's hopeless. <laughs> How can I possibly get through this? And it, uh, I finally realized uh, in, 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 in computer terms, we had the Old Testament and then Christ came in with Moses 2.0 to make sure we understood you can't possibly live a holy life. And then uh, understanding that Christ's uh, promise does, is an inheritance that only came to after his death. So his teaching was to set the stage for his death. And grace comes in, the inheritance comes in, just like any inheritance. It only comes in after Christ's death. So it just took me a while where I could get it in my head and process it. Uh, I, I uh, had written a book called Faith Logic, and it uh, sounds like an oxymoron, but it's, it's really written for the uh, strong-willed, spiritually challenged person who has to just really beat through the, the thinking process uh, to overcome the doubts. Mm. We're visiting with Dr. John Water and Dr. Jim Weatherby. And, and uh, Jim, uh, a follow-up question. Uh, how do you know uh, John? John was a pastor of a church that I was attending that was recommended by my uh, mother, who we were kind of taking care of at the time, which meant I was reluctant because she was one of those beautiful people who had no trouble believing. And I thought, well, he won't work for me. I, I need someone who's kind of rigorous. And then I, uh, I went to the church. I was really impressed with John. I quickly realized this guy could be a business executive. Uh, he's just a very pragmatic man. And I got to know him, and I talked to him. And uh, and, and you, you asked, did he ever share his agnostic uh, stage with anyone in a helpful way? He shared it with me because when I shared some of the things I was struggling with in my early 30s, uh, and this is 35 years ago, uh, John uh, – it admitted that he went through an agnostic stage, and I thought, wow, that's that's a confident, authentic man to tell that to someone who attends his church. And that led to conversation. I told him, John, I, I want to go to, to, to Jerusalem, corporate headquarters for the big three religions, and really spend some time kind of studying. And I, I, here was the deal I made him. I said, I'll give you an all-expenses-paid trip if you'll be my private tutor, because you're a man I could learn a lot from. And it was during that trip that our friendship really uh, cemented to a, a much higher level. Uh, you mentioned it, I think, a moment ago. You've written things before. Uh, John, have you written uh, things, uh, books prior to this? I have. And could I just add one other thing? Yes, Greg? if you could speak up as well, that would be helpful. Yeah, yeah, to the question you asked, Jim, and that is that I told a story in church one day of being propositioned when I was 15 by a man in our neighborhood. And I'll, we also tell the story in the book, and I used the word proposition. And Jim came up afterwards and said, that man didn't proposition you, he sexually abused you. And I said, no, he didn't, he propositioned me. No, he didn't, he sexually abused you. And we sounded like two junior high boys arguing back and forth. And finally, Jim said, John, someone does not have to touch you to abuse you. And I'd never heard that, I didn't know it. But I thought, my goodness, if this man can come up and be this honest, to help me right here standing in front of the pulpit after the service is over, I want to get to know him better. So for in my perspective, that was when the relationship started because I saw this was a man I could trust because he was willing to correct me and help me out. And uh, that was a, uh, it was a great thing. My other two books are a book called Uncommon Graces, Christ-like Responses to a Hostile World, and then hit by a ton of bricks, you're not alone when your child's on drugs, unfortunately, and it's not a, it's not a family secret, it's very public. Uh, one of our children got involved in drugs, uh, was actually addicted to heroin, and she's now a, an addiction counselor for the Salvation Army Treatment Center here in Phoenix. But out of all of that pain and turmoil came a book and a radio program that we've now given away. It's on over 400 stations and a website that helps a lot of people. So uh, I added a book about helping families whose kids are abusing drugs or alcohol. Mm. So the, the next obvious question I have as we kind of move into the book, uh, Achieving High Performance Friendship, a book for men. You two wrote the book together. So I assume that maybe this book is based on things that you've learned about your own friendship. Uh, Jim, you can answer that. Well, actually, where the book came from was... Uh, John had often been asked to write a book on friendship because he, he spoke a lot about it. 
and he reached out to me to help with it. And I told him, John, you've always used in your basic message uh, conforming to the image of Christ as uh, an overall theme. Are we still connected? Oh, yeah, we're, we're here. Okay. The phone sounded like it was dead for a second. Uh, at any rate, uh, so, John, I said, why don't we just think of a Christ-like friendship? And as it turned out, that worked out as a great uh, uh, acronym for the chapters, like C is for how you choose your friends of Christ, H is humility and honesty, R is for respect, I is for intimacy, and so forth. And so that was the... Um, the basic framework that we ended up uh, using for the book, and that's how we ended up writing it together. Mm. Uh, we, John, any thoughts? Yeah, we say, well, we say one other thing, and that is that uh, non-Christian men can have good, loving friendships, or I, as a Christian man, can have a good, loving, respectful friendship with a non-Christian man, but the high-performance friendship has to be between two or among some Christian men, because it's only at that point with becoming conformed to the image of Christ that we can help one another grow. Mm. Now, on your what little... we actually were doing yeah. was, was taking a look. We have three years of documentation of how Jesus interacted with his friends on earth, and there is a wealth of insight to be gained uh, on how men can be better friends from, from taking a close look at that. Mm. On my little cheat sheet here, I have a from your uh, publicist, it um, talks about the different things. Admit the need, take the risk, begin the journey, the five levels of friendship, and the perfect model of male friendship. Uh, first of all, um, John, why don't you uh, speak on the heading, Admit the Need? Well, it's really difficult, Greg, and, and you know this as a man in our society, and, and let me quickly say I'd rather live in the United States than anywhere else. I'd rather pay taxes here than anywhere else. And I've been, I've spoken in 17 countries, so I, I think I know what I'm talking about. But our culture it teaches us that real men are strong. They never admit any vulnerability. They never acknowledge anything's wrong. And when we still had the drug ministry, interestingly enough, most of the calls or emails came from the mothers, not from the fathers. Just the other day, I was in uh, California speaking at a conference, and a man was introducing a seminar. He's a financial expert, and he said, 95% of my calls when a family is in trouble financially come from the wife, not the husband. And so I went to him later and said, my goodness, that is it parallels what we found in our ministry with helping families whose kids are on drugs. So our culture teaches us that real men don't cry, real men aren't compassionate, which is the opposite of who Jesus Christ was. So Jim and I are saying the first thing we have to say and admit is, I need other men in my life who will poke me in the eye once in a while, affirm me when I need affirmation, and help me in the process of becoming conformed to the image of Christ. Uh, Paul Turnier, the Swiss psychologist, says we were created to be social people. That's why the Spirit of God gave spiritual gifts. And in Ephesians 4, Jesus gave gifted people of the church to help us all grow in our faith and have an impact on other people. We can't be islands unto ourselves. Mm. Jim, uh, take the risk. Speak on that. Well, you know, I work with a lot of entrepreneurs in my in, as a business professor, and, uh, you know, you, you can't achieve great things without taking some risk. And so in a friendship, uh, you have to be willing to be vulnerable first if you expect the other person to be vulnerable. It's a little bit like a mirror. And taking a look at Christ, in fact, our chapter on intimacy, uh, a great example is set there. Christ, when he went to the Garden of Gethsemane, he took his best friends with him, and he let them hear him pray a very agonizing prayer. And we know that because it's documented uh, in the Gospel. And so that was a willingness to to open up in front of his friends in a very convincing way uh, where men tend to be so, in our culture, as John says, macho and, and never wanting to show weakness, would never open up and just say, I, I am really hurting, and uh, I, need, I need some help. And so uh, that, that's a, an example of how we need to be able to reach out to people and, and take a risk. Even uh, I had a, a Sunday school teacher that just really amazed me, because first of all, I was very impressed with him. He seemed so saintly. But during a Sunday school class, he, he took a risk. He, he talked about the need to have someone to, to uh, hold you accountable. 
and uh, he then talked about getting uh, somewhat addicted to uh, internet pornography. And first, I was just stunned he would uh, have done that. It just seemed out of his character. And then second, that he would share that openly like that. And then he talked about how his brother was uh, one of his uh, friends. I'd call him certainly a high-performance friend. And he reached out to him and said, someone's got to hold me accountable and, and get me past this. And, and his brother helped him with that. But you can imagine how much more open that Sunday school class uh, became after uh, the leader was willing to open up about something he struggled with. And that's the risk that we take. Mm. We are visiting with Dr. John Vwater and Dr. Jim Weatherby, the authors of Achieving High Performance Friendship, a book for men. And uh, uh, Jim, if you could, is there, is there a website that uh, one could visit to learn more about uh, yourself or John or about the book? John, you have that memorized, don't you? Yeah, the, well, it's just the title of the book, and that is AchievingHighPerformanceFriendship.org. Okay, so it's AchievingHighPerformanceFriendship.org. Uh, right. Okay. Uh, is there uh, also uh, 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 suggested... I'm sorry, say that again, John? It's a long address, but it's a memorable one. Oh, yes, you won't forget it. If you're interested in the book, you're certainly <laughs> Except not going to... for this f- absent-minded professor. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, John, tell us if you could, uh, why do most men not have intimate male friendships? Why is it? Yeah, first of all, uh, let me explain that uh, I was really s- s- stricken one day in, in reading John chapter 13 through 17, where Jesus is, has gathered the disciples into the upper room to give them what I call their final marching orders. And in John 13, he's, after Judas betrays him, he said, I no longer call you my servants, I call you my friends, and everything that the Father has given me, I give to you. And you know, I, a seminary graduate, I, I don't say I know the Greek language very well, but I understand in, in the Greek language, everything means everything. So if I have given you everything, I can't give you any more. And I began to think about that and realize that Jesus hadn't held anything back. And I thought about my relationship with my wife, Susan. We just celebrated our 46th anniversary in July. There are no secrets. I trust her. And John says, perfect love casts out fear. And so I realized that Jesus was modeling intimacy there. And as Jim said earlier, Jesus was certainly modeling it in the in, in, in the Garden of Gethsemane when he was praying because he allowed Peter, James, and John to be close enough to know what he was going through and to hear what he was praying, even saying to them, don't leave me, I need you here with me. However, uh, again, our culture teaches us not to be intimate and not to be vulnerable. I, I just think of uh, when I was in the eighth grade, I went uh, w- to, to, with my uncle to watch my brother play a high school football game and the uh, center on my and my uncle was a great athlete he he was a two-sport athlete in college a coach after that he had a chance to play professional baseball and the center on my brother's team was limped off the field with his arms around two other players and then he got up and walked up and down behind the bench and my uncle said not out loud but just said it he said that's the way to go jim walk it off well on monday when my brother got home from practice he said Jim broke his ankle. So Jim was actually walking on a broken ankle there be- behind the bench. But I just sort of picked that up from my uncle and my father that big boys don't cry and you walk off the pain and you don't acknowledge the pain. And I think that's uh, evident just throughout our culture that if you're a real man, you're, you, you show no vul- vulnerability, you don't ad- admit any pain. Uh, I've, had, I've been with friends before who've not told me about a tragedy in their life, and then I would come home from seeing them. And while I was with the man, my wife Susan and the man's wife had spoken, and Susan told me all about this tragedy that hit their family, and he said nothing to me about it. It's just, And as Francis Schaeffer said, the spirit of the age always finds its way into the church. And so I think, as Paul says in Romans, we are in the process of becoming conformed to Christ. And mm-hmm. as, Jesus, as Paul said, letting old things pass away. And, and we just have to accept the fact that our culture teaches us incorrectly in some things and does not teach us to live how Christ taught us to live. 
Jim, uh, you or John, uh, any plans on uh, doing another uh, book together on another topic, or is this probably a, a one and done as far as uh, working together? That's a question we haven't really explored. We've been, <laughs> we've been busy uh, doing a lot of interviews and uh, thinking of things we would like to add to the book in, in, in a future edition, but haven't really talked about a different book. But if, if I could just tack one thing onto what John said there. Cause sure. This, this intimacy thing. One thing I learned from John, now John's a pastor, so he has to deal with families who, who are grieving. And one of the lessons he taught me was how often men would say, men will call and, and, and ask, how's my wife doing? And then say, the wife should talk. They never ask how I'm doing. And, 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 and men feel like they're not getting the support from their friends. And this is why we actually call it a book for men, because we acknowledge right up front, women are better at being uh, open and going deep with a friendship. But I, I had a colleague uh, at the university who whose son was tragically killed in an auto-related accident. And I was uh, talking to a colleague about going over and and uh, another colleague, and, and uh, no, no, I don't think so. May, may, I'll wait a couple of weeks. There's a lot of cars over there, and I'm not sure I should. But I, but I drew from, from, I learned from John's experience and so I, I and I was apprehensive, but I went over there, and I, and I came in, and and uh, my colleague came up, and uh, Greg he hugged me in a way that I've never been hugged before, and I, uh, it, it, intimate isn't the word. I would just say it felt it felt like this really deep sense of gratitude that I would be there, and uh, I'll never forget that hug, and I shared it with my uh, other friends. And after that, one by one, they, they were comfortable, and they went over, and, and they thanked me later for, for doing that. But I wouldn't have felt comfortable doing that had I not learned from John that men feel lonely, and, and the wives reach out to each other as friends, but the men just don't get that. Understood. Gentlemen, uh, unfortunately, we're going to have to leave it there, but of course, the, the most important reason that this program is put on week after week, month after month, is for the people that are lost, that are looking for that spiritual hug, if you will, to be set free, to have that second chance in their life. And, and John, would you be willing to lead our listeners that are uh, ready and willing to ask Jesus Christ to be the Lord of their life? Would you lead them in a prayer to do so? Yes, I, I, I would be honored. Father, first of all, uh, thank you that uh, Greg, Jim, and I can talk about faith because we know you and you're in the process of changing our lives through the Spirit in our lives. Pray for any listeners right now who might not know you, that they would understand what they're missing and help them to be courageous enough to simply say, Father, I am sinful and imperfect. I need to be forgiven for my sin. I ask you to forgive my sin. And I ask Jesus Christ to come into my life and live his life through me. And I pray this in the name of Christ. Amen. Our guest on Second Chances has been Dr. John Water and Dr. Jim Weatherby. And the book has been entitled Achieving High Performance Friendship, a book for men. And uh, Jim, or actually uh, John, one more time, the website uh, that they can visit to learn more about uh, you and your friend Jim and the book. AchievingHighPerformanceFriendship.org Easy one to remember, for sure. <laughs> and our guest has been Dr. John Water and Dr. Jim Weatherby. Thank you both for joining us here on Second Chances. Greg, thank you so much. It has been a, it's been a privilege and it's been a blessing. Tune in next thank week you. for more Second Chances from Advantage Radio Ministries. <laughs>